today. I'm so pleased with so many people interested in our shorebirds and interested in learning how to help them. And um, I, I, I just, I'm thrilled and I hope that you enjoy everything that you hear today. Thanks for setting it up. You're welcome. Okay, well, very good. Um, so we are recording this so that it can be available for, for people that aren't able to join today. Um, I do ask that while we're, we're in the presentation, um, everybody kind of mute yourself so we don't have any background noise or anything like that. And then if you have any, any questions during the program, um, there's a chat function if you look down there. And if you, what, the, what, what makes, might make the most sense and easiest to do is if you have a question, just write it in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, uh, what I might do is just kind of go through the chat questions and then try to answer as many as possible, depending on how much time we are. And any other, any questions that maybe I don't get answered, um, what we could do is send, a, I can kind of like do a, a Q and A from those questions and we can send out the answers like in an email to the entire group kind of answering each of those questions individually um, as well. Um, all right, so it looks like we've got about 25 people on. So I think I'm gonna start sharing my screen and uh, we will kind of get started here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yes, good. Um, okay, well, my, my name is Aaron Given. Um, I'm a, a wildlife biologist here for the town of Kiowa. Um, and several years back, we had started the Kiowa Island Shorebird Stewardship Program. Uh, the main goal of this was to try to um, help protect the shorebirds that, that use our beach, um, either for nesting or for resting or feeding. Um, you know, a lot of these birds are in, in trouble and their numbers are declining. So, um, and we'll get into the reasons why here in a little bit, but um, just kind of that's, that's kind of why we're here today um, is to learn a little bit more about shorebirds and what we can do kind of locally um, to, to help them. Okay, so a study came out in 2019. Um, this was a North American Bird Conservation Initiative. It was a joint study by lots of different organizations. And they came together and kind of de um, de determined that about 2.9 billion birds uh, have gone, um, basically we have lost 2.9 billion birds since 1970. Um, and of those, um, you know, forest birds represent um, about 22% of species of forest birds have declined. 37% of shorebirds have declined. Uh, and 53% of the grassland bird species have, has also declined during that time. Uh, so today we're focusing mainly on the shorebirds, um, but you know the decline is not just, um, it's, a, it's a bigger problem um, across all different kinds of groups of birds, not just, not just shorebirds. So kind of also looking through some more literature, I was able to kind of come up with some species specific numbers um, and looking at all shorebird species um, combined, 68% uh, of those species are declining. Uh, so for instance, ruddy turnstone, uh, that's a species that we, we see on our beach. Um, they have had about an 80% decline since 1974. Uh, Semi-pollinated sandpiper populations. Uh, we don't have a great number on that other than we know that those numbers in the last five or so years have, have shown a, a pretty significant decline in their population. Uh, red knots, um, that's one of our famous birds here on the island about this time of year. Um, from the 1980s to the early 2000s, uh, the population of, of red knots have declined uh, between 70 and 80 percent, depending on which study you look at. Um, but as of recently, um, it appears that the population of red knots may has may have stabilized a little bit, um, and that population kind of sits at around 50,000 individuals currently. Um, 
So some good news, um, American oyster catchers, um, their population actually has increased about 23% in the last 19 years. All right, so, so why do these birds need our protection? Um, so for one, um, they're, they're getting kind of hammered from all directions. So habitat loss is a major concern for these, these species, um, these birds. Um, either naturally, um, like hurricanes, tropical storms, uh, which erodes the beaches, uh, that loses, you know, makes their habitat um, uh, less than what it may be. Um, Human-caused um, habitat loss through through development. Um, coastal areas are very popular. Uh, people want to live here, and uh, you know, so sometimes the the development in certain areas can can change the way. Uh, the beaches and, and things like that uh, are available for, for birds. Uh, and then sea level rise and climate change. So, you know, as, as the sea level rises, you know, a lot of areas that, um, that are currently, you know, beachy and sandy may, may, um, get, um, may get lost uh, into, the, into the ocean. So. Uh, another, another reason is disturbance. So, you know, People and, and these birds kind of have to share these beaches. Um, and as, as humans, you know, we have our, we, we like to go to the beach, but that's also where the birds, uh, these shorebirds spend almost their entire life. So, um, you know, be, being, having these birds be disturbed when they're nesting or just feeding or roosting um, can cause significant um, damage to, to an individual bird's sustainability over time, but also the population at large. Um, dogs also can, can pose a, a, a really um, negative threat to birds. Uh, they see dogs as, as a predator, and in doing so, they tend to flee um, a dog much quicker than they would a person who might be walking on the beach. So if you've ever walked on the beach, you know, you've noticed that you can kind of walk pretty close to some of these shorebirds without them you know, flying away. Um, but if a person with a dog either on leash or off leash is doing the same thing, those birds are going to fly much sooner before that, that uh, before the dog approaches than they would just a, a person. Uh, and then of course, natural predation. Um, you know, that's, that's something that, that happens um, naturally. You know, gulls can predate nests of shorebirds. Um, they'll eat the, the eggs and the chicks. Uh, raccoons and bobcats and coyotes and and other armadillos and you know just other other critters that that can forage out on the beach that will stumble upon you know a nest and you know they're not going to pass up a, a nest full of, of eggs to, to eat. Uh, another uh, another reason is loss of food. So I've had horseshoe crab harvesting here and this is in direct relation to uh, the red knots. Um, so during, during red knot migration, they rely heavily on horseshoe crab eggs. So they time their migration to certain areas where there's high concentration of mating horseshoe crabs. And they feast on those eggs in order to get enough fat to get them to the Arctic to where they breed. Um, and the horseshoe crabs have also been a target of, of harvesting for, for bait. Um, they, they'll catch harvest horseshoe crabs um, and they'll use horseshoe, pieces of horseshoe crabs as bait for commercial fishing. Um, and there's also, they use horseshoe crabs in the, the medical trade to basically, they will drain and take blood from horseshoe crabs um, and they'll use it to develop different types of drugs and things like that. Um, now they, they do release those horseshoe crabs back into the wild after they've taken, you know, a blood sample from them. But it's unclear how many of those horseshoe crabs actually survive after after that happens. Uh, and then hunting, um, believe it or not, shorebirds are hunted in some parts of the world, and sometimes hunting pressure can be really really heavy on them. Um, you know, we don't we don't have hunting on shorebirds in in this country, other than a couple of species um, that are hunted: American woodcock and uh, Wilson snipe are two species of shorebirds that, that are a game bird in the United States. Um, but they, those, both of those species are typically not found on the beaches. 
<clears throat> so what can we do? Um, you know, a lot of this stuff is kind of out of our hands um, as far as what we can do. Uh, but the one thing we can do is address the disturbance issue. Uh, and that's kind of going to be the impetus of this the impetus of this talk today um, is how can we can reduce disturbance to these shorebirds um, that we're, we're sharing the beach with. Uh, so we do this by by the creation of the shorebird stewardship program. Um, and this is mainly an educational program uh, where we're, we're talking to the public out on the beach. We're showing them the birds. We're, you know, teaching them you know, why it's important to not ride that your bike through that big flock of birds that, that might be feeding or resting on the beach. So the objectives of this program, um, you know, essentially, you know, we're, we're ambassadors for the birds. So, you know, the birds can't say, you know, help me um, directly. So that's kind of our job. Um, so we're, we're out there on the beach trying to um, steward or be ambassadors for those birds. Um, and by doing this, um, we're, we're educating the public. Uh, we try to enhance the beachgoers experience. So I think if, if, a, if a beachgoer who may not know a lot about shorebirds can, can learn one little tidbit about, you know, a bird they may see on the beach, they may show a greater appreciation for that the next time they're at the beach. Uh, maybe they'll tell another person about that. And, you know, and it kind of can spread like wildfire. And, uh, you know, we, we may tell one person and that person tells another person something. So, um, you know, we can indirectly also get a lot of people um, by just telling one person. And then finally, we, we are going, we, uh, we can protect key habitats. So, um, and I'll go into some of that a little bit later. Uh, what we do currently on Kiowa to, to protect uh, some of these habitats that the shorebirds are using. All right, so I'm going to shift focus a little bit here, um, and I'm going to go over some, some of the birds that, that we see on the beach. Um, we've identified five focal species um, that, that we basically are using as, um, as birds that, that do something on our beach that, that are either unique or is important, um, or maybe uh, their status may be endangered or threatened or something like that. So by doing so, we, by protecting or by talking about you know, these five species, we, we can actually you know, protect all the species that use the beach. Um, and you know, we don't have to get overwhelmed by the, you know, the 30 plus some species of shorebirds that may use the beach and you know, another 10 or 12 species of terns and that use the beach. By just focusing on a small group, we can, we can expand that and, and help all the birds on the beach. Uh, so the five focal species that we'll, we'll look at here now um, is uh, least tern. Uh, that's this, this bird here up in the, the top left corner. Uh, we, well, next is the Wilson's Plover. Uh, that's this guy here. I don't know if my cursor is showing up on your screen or not, but it it's pointing at the, at the bird. Uh, American Oyster Catcher is the next one. That's the guy here in the middle with the black head and the big red bill. Piping Plover on the far right. And then on the bottom, uh, we have Red Knots. So I'm going to start with talking about least terns first. Um, so this is the smallest tern species that we have in North America. Um, they're no bigger than the size of, of an American robin um, that you may be familiar with from your backyard. Um, these guys um, are birds that actually they'll, they nest here on Kiowa. So they're, they're here mainly in the summertime. Uh, they'll begin to arrive here shortly, probably by the end of March, we'll start seeing birds um, arrive and then by April, they're going to start courting and starting to begin and beginning to nest. Um, what some one of the kind of things about these guys is they are um, colonial nesters. So rather than just picking a random spot on the beach to lay their nest, isolated from other birds, they'll actually nest in a big group. Um, and the idea for that is, you know, safety in numbers. So if you have a bunch of birds all packed together, um, you know, in an area. You can have more eyes to look out for predators. And you know, if there is a gull that comes by, 
you'll have a lot of birds that can kind of go after that one goal and chase it away rather than just having one, one species um, or one, one individual trying to fight off a, a much larger goal. Um, there is some drawbacks to this strategy is, you know, they're basically putting all their eggs in one basket, if you will. So, you know, a, a disturbance event, whether it be, you know, a person or um, a predator that may, you know, find this colony, um, the entire colony could get, could get basically, you know, lost or wiped out in that, that year. Um, it doesn't take a lot of disturbance for for a, a bunch of colony nesters to abandon that area and maybe try to find a different place. Um, same thing with, you know, an overwash event. You know, if we happen to have a storm or a big high tide and they're, the area that they've chosen to nest uh, gets flooded, you know, that, that area then, that, that whole colony is, is in jeopardy because of that. Um, these birds lay their eggs directly on the sand. Um, they really don't build a nest other than they create a little depression um, in the sand. And sometimes they'll, you know, they'll have a couple like a shell or maybe a piece of debris that they'll try to put their nest by. But generally it's just an, an open little depression in the sand and they, they lay their eggs right on top of the, the sand. Um, another, another thing that these least terns and, and even some other new species here recently have, have adapted to is in the, because of their habitat has, has been lost so much, they, they have started to nest on top of roofs. Um, so these big flat roofs on industrial buildings that have these little tiny pea gravel um, on top, um, they, it, it is a good mimic for, for a beach. And these birds have taken advantage of that and have nest, started to nest on top of, of these roof structures. Um, and sometimes they're gonna go, they'll go way inland to do it. You know, so they may travel, you know, 10, 20 miles inland from the beach to, to go and, and lay their eggs on top of a roof. Um, um, nesting on top of a roof also has its disadvantages. Um, you're pretty high up. So there's, you know, the, the chicks, um, they don't, they can't fly for, for you know, a month or more um, after they, they hatch. So there's, you know, the threat of them running and falling off the roof. And things like that. So, um, the, luckily, we know where most. I say we. Um, it's DNR, South Carolina DNR knows where most of these rooftop nesting colonies are, and they will talk to the owner of the building. Um, and they they've got agreements with a lot of them to put up different things on top of the roof to try to keep um, those colonies as safe as possible. Um, these guys, least terns are a, they, they are listed as a South Carolina threatened species. Um, so they are not listed federally, um, but at the state level, they are um, listed as threatened. Um, this is kind of an old stat. I forgot to update, um, but it really didn't change a whole lot last year. Um, but in, in 2020, we had about 150 nests on Kiowa, um, and these birds nested at the far east end of the island um, and last year they returned um, and we had about another 150 or so nests again last year. So this is kind of what a least turn looks like. Um, I mentioned it's the smallest turn that we have. Um, one of the main identifiers is this yellow bill. Uh, all the other turns that we have um, on our, on our on Kiowa will either have a black bill or an orange bill. Um, they also have these yellow feet. So if you see a small turn with a yellow bill and yellow feet, um, there's a good chance that that is a, uh, the least turn. They also have this white, this black kind of hood with a black eye uh, stripe through their eye and, and this kind of white forehead. Uh, juveniles kind of look similar like the bird here down in the, the left corner. Uh, they look a little different than the adults. Um, they don't have that yellow bill yet, but you know, as, as they mature, that bill will change color um, and it will eventually kind of turn to that yellow color. Uh, so this is a picture from a couple years ago um, of a least turned chick. This is a chick that is probably only a few days old. Um, 
and there's the parent sitting by. Um, so these, these birds are mobile within hours of hatching from their egg. So, um, you know, unlike a, a songbird, which, you know, when they hatch out of their egg, they're completely featherless, featherless and helpless. Um, these birds have a downy coat, uh, a set of feathers on them. And within a couple hours, they're able to actually get up and run around a little bit. Um, and what they basically do is they will try to get to find some cover. So, you know, this may not be where that bird had the nest at, but you'll see some grasses here and some rack. So that, that chick may have nested close by and then ran to where there's some cover for it to hide. <laughs> yeah, it is big. I wonder how big the egg is. Yeah. All right, so the next uh, bird we're gonna talk about is the Wilson's Clover. Um, this is another species that nests on the island. Um, and they're a medium-sized plover. Uh, you can kind of see down here, um, and I'll show, talk a little bit about what they look like next. Uh, but they're also going to start nesting around the same time as the least terns. <clears throat> um, we do have Wilson's plovers here year-round, so we do have birds that, that breed here, and then we have birds that actually stay year-round and they do not migrate away. And then we have other, other individuals that breed here and then migrate um, away um, to, to either South America or the Caribbean islands. Uh, and just kind of a fun little fact, um, if you notice this bird here on the bottom, there's that, he has this green um, kind of a flag hanging off of his leg. So that's a bird that I actually caught and I marked it with that flag and it has three letters on it. Um, so I have, there's, I've marked several of these Wilson's plovers over the years and um, just uh, a few weeks ago, we got word that one of the Wilson's plovers that, that I had banded back in 2015 was recited down in Venezuela. So um, that bird bred on Kiowa and then it migrated south all the way to, to Venezuela and it spending, spends its winters down in, in Venezuela. So that's, that's kind of a, 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 neat, a neat little thing to kind of connect the dots to some, where these birds actually go and, and how far they're actually traveling. Um, so one thing that's different about Wilson's clovers compared to least terns is these guys are mainly a solitary nester, so they're not nesting in a big colony. Um, they will sometimes nest in the colony with least terns, and they'll take advantage of that, but they're not going to nest in a colony with other Wilson's plovers. Um, these guys are a little bit more territorial and have and will defend a territory and keep other Wilson's plovers out. Um, so in turn, they, they, they tend to nest um, in areas that have a little bit more denser vegetation. So they, they hide their eggs a little bit better. So they'll, they'll, you know, as you can see here, there's a lot more vegetation around. So their, their nests are a little bit more concealed. Uh, they also lay their nest directly on the ground um, and they just form a little, a little depression in the nest as well. Um, and similar to least turns, uh, their status is also um, threatened at the state level, um, but there is no, no status at the federal level. Um, and for the last several years, uh, we've been, um, we've hosted many nesting pairs um, on Kiowa. Uh, last year, you know, I would estimate we probably had about 12 different pairs nesting out on the east end. Um, and I don't know of any on the West End, um, but I have a feeling that we may have some this year because that habitat has gotten much better down at the, the West End or, the, or towards, the, towards the Seabrook um, end of Kiel. So this is kind of what Wilson's plovers look like. Um, a lot of plovers look, you know, so compared to other shorebirds, they have a much shorter bill. Um, but of the plover species, they have one of the longest or largest bills. Um, and usually that's kind of one of the best ways to, to tell them apart from other plovers is because of, of how stout their bill is compared to their body size. Uh, they do have this, males have this dark black band on their chest. Females have a more brown band, but otherwise they look almost identical. Um, instead of having kind of bright yellow legs, like some of the other plovers might, their leg color is more of a flesh color. 
Um, and overall, these, both of these are males here. Um, this must be before, if this is either winter time or this is during, uh, before they get territorial, because uh, usually two males will have, will chase each other around and we will not allow them to get that close together. <laughs> Um, so one of the one of the keys to shorebird success is is camouflage, um, and it might be hard to see, but there are two Wilson's plover chicks in this photo. Um, you know they they rely heavily on camouflage. Um, if you can see them, but I'll point to here's one here, and here's the other one here. So they they blend in with their surroundings really well, uh, which kind of makes them potentially vulnerable. Um, you know, if, if a person happens to be walking on the beach, you know, they're, they're so concealed that that <laughs> bird, like, there's, it's possible that a bird, that a person could step on a chick or an egg um, because of the nest that it might be at. Um, so one of the unique behaviors that Wilson's plovers have is what they call a broken wing display. And if, if somebody gets too close, um, to a nest, and this happens with a, either a predator as well, um, the, the adult will pretend like it has a broken wing and it will kind of flop on its side and drag a wing on the ground and lure that person or predator away from the nest or their chicks. And if they can lure that predator away um, far enough, then they basically get that whatever away from their nest or chicks uh, and then they fly off. Um, so it's a, a strategy that a lot of shorebirds will employ um, to do that, um, and it can be fairly successful. So, you know, if, if you happen to be on the beach and you see a bird doing that to you, um, there's a good chance there is a nest nearby, um, and, you know, you should potentially just kind of back away from, from that area um, so you don't, don't happen to inadvertently step on either eggs or, or chicks. <clears throat> All right, the other species we're going to talk about is the American oyster catcher. <clears throat> uh, so this is a larger bird, much larger than the other two species we've talked about. Um, this bird probably stands almost uh, potentially a foot tall if it's, you know, it's sitting up. Um, these guys will begin nesting. These guys do nest on the beach. Um, they're also solitary nesters. Um, and we don't have as many of them on Kiowa. Um, but we will, but last year, uh, or in 2020, we had about six to eight nests on Kiowa. And last year, we probably had about five or six. Um, they also lay their eggs directly on the sand. Uh, generally, they typically will find a, a higher part in the, like a little dunelet that might be higher than the surrounding area that they'll choose to, to put their eggs on. Um, and that just reduces the risk of, of their eggs getting overwashed. <clears throat> Uh, these guys feed mainly on bivalves, so they're called an oyster catcher for a reason. Uh, their bill is specialized to pry open clams and other um, other type of, of bivalves, and then they can insert that into that muscle, and they'll clip that muscle, which then will help relax the the uh, the, the oyster or the clam, and then they can eat eat what's inside. Uh, so this is what they look like. They're a pretty striking bird. Um, you know, so they have this dark black head with this bright orange bill, uh, bright yellow eye with a, a red eye ring around it. Um, their back is usually a little bit browner than their head. And they have this kind of just a white underside um, and these flesh colored legs. Um, if you if you've ever been on the beach and seen one of these, um, they are, they're pretty obvious and they stick out um, compared to a lot of the other birds. Uh, they're also pretty noisy too. So they make a lot of noise. And if you happen to get close to a nest, um, they will kind of walk off um, and they will sometimes kind of yell at you as well as, as they're, they walked off. <clears throat> um, so they're, they're very good parents. Um, they, both, both the male and the female, like a lot of shorebirds, tend to the to the chicks um, and the eggs. You know, they will take turns incubating 
the eggs. So while one sits on the nest, the other parent is out feeding and then they'll take gifts, then they'll trade off and the other one will sit while the other one goes off to feed. Um, they both take part in raising uh, their young chicks here. Um, this is a, a young bird that's it's hard to tell. He's a pretty old chick. Um, probably cannot fly yet, but is getting maybe close to that point. Um, but uh, what these parents will do is they'll, they'll, once they, they leave the nest, they'll kind of basically teach them how to forage and they'll, they'll point to things in the, you know, and put their bill down. And rather than feeding their chicks, they'll basically show them how to do it. And then the chicks learn from their parents how, how, to, how to do that. All right, the last species we're going to talk about is the red knot. Um, so this is a kind of your quintessential sand or sandpiper looking bird. Um, they are a, a sandpiper in the sandpiper group, uh, which is different than your plovers or your terns. Uh, this is a medium sized shorebird. Um, if I was to kind of compare that bird to something that you might be familiar with, um, I would say maybe an American robin again would be a good, um, maybe a little slightly larger than that, but kind of a good comparison. Um, these guys are migrants, meaning that they do not, um, they're, they're, they migrate from, from one place in the winter and they go someplace else in the summertime. Um, and they do not nest here on Kiowa. So they're only here uh, either during the winter time or during migration. Um, but what's unique about them is that during, from March through May, um, Kiowa, Seabrook, um, kind of this, this area um, is a, a staging area for, for several thousand red knots during the springtime. And they're here to basically fatten up um, so that they can make their, their journey all the way up to the Arctic um, for nesting. So if you look at their range here, you see that they spend, they winter all along South America and many of them go all the way down to the southern tip of South America for the winter. Uh, but the entire population goes to the Arctic to breed either up here in Canada or there's some Western populations here that breed in Alaska. Uh, but most of the, all the birds that we see here in South Carolina probably go up to the high Arctic here in Canada. <clears throat> uh, so these guys just recently, I'd say, I forget the year now, um, maybe 2018, um, they got federal, um, they got uh, listed to the, on the Endangered Species Act federally, and they are listed as threatened uh, due to what I talked about earlier. Um, is their, their, their huge population crash, uh, mainly attributed to the, the horseshoe crab um, population that was, that was declined, that has declined over the years. Um, so at the peak of migration here at Kiowa, we could have close to 4,000 red knots um, that can be seen on Kiowa. Um, and you'll usually see them all in a huge group on the beach. Uh, so this is kind of an example of, of how, what you might see if you were on the beach and you saw red knots, um, you know, they, they, during high tide, um, they are generally roosting somewhere and they'll all roost together in a huge flock. And then as that tide recedes, it, it makes the beach available to them to feed. Uh, and when they're here, they're eating mostly small bivalves, the like coquina clamshell um, clams is what they're, they're eating. Uh, unless there happens to be a horseshoe crab spawns somewhere and somehow they all learn know about it and they may leave they may leave Kiowa for a few days and they may go and feast on horseshoe crabs somewhere um, so Devote Bank which is right at the kind of at, at off of Seabrook Island um, is an area that that horseshoe crabs can spawn so you know sometimes the birds will leave leave he around here and they'll go to DeVoe Bank and spend, you know, several days eating horseshoe crabs. Um, we've also had in years past where um, down at Harbor Island, which is pretty far south of us, um, they'll have a horseshoe crab spawn and the birds all somehow know and uh, will all spend a, 
several days down there and eating horseshoe crabs. And then once that, once they eat all the horseshoe crabs and they kind of come back. Um, so red knots have one of the large, longest migrations of any birds. Um, so they may travel over 9,000 miles from their wintering area at the tip of South America to their Arctic breeding grounds. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, a lot of them population will come all the way here and they will nest all the way um, in the Arctic. Um, and they do this in the spring um, in, in a kind of, in a fairly um, predictable manner. So they, they will take their flight from, from southern tip of South America and they will fly nonstop to another staging area here in northern part of South America. And they may stage here for a while and fatten up. Um, and then from here, they'll fly over the open ocean for several days without stopping until they reach the east coast of, of the United States. Um, some birds will, will hit South Carolina, others will go up to Delaware Bay, which is another um, kind of historical roosting um, or staging area for, for red knots during the spring. Uh, so this is a critical time in the red knots life and they need to be able to build up enough fat in order to make these large jumps from, you know, several thousand miles, you know, from, from, from the southern tip of South America to the northern part of South America. And then they go from south northern part of South America to the United East Coast. And then from the East Coast, either from, from our area or Delaware Bay, they'll fly nonstop over the continent all the way up to their breeding grounds. So you know, they're making these huge migrations and they're doing it in, you know, in these, in these big continuous flights as well. <clears throat> so when you see these huge flocks of red knots on the beach, you know, they're, they're here to basically eat and rest. So, you know, they're, they're gorging themselves as fast as they possibly can to put on as much fat and weight as they can so that they can, when they leave here, um, they're not stopping again until they get either to the Arctic um, or sometimes a staging area here in, in Hudson Bay. Um, but a lot of these birds are going directly from, from the Kiowa area all the way to the Arctic um, to breed. So this is kind of what they look like. Um, so for most of the time when red knots are here, they're just going to look like a gray and white bird. Um, so, um, you know, they kind of have a grayish back and a white underside. Um, one thing that red knots have that, that some of the other shorebirds might not is these kind of these barred flanks. So they have some streaking here kind of towards the back end or the side of their, their body. Uh, in general, their, bot, their legs are going to be dark. Um, sometimes they're kind of a yellowish, like these are younger birds um, that have yellowish legs, but a lot of them will have black legs. And they'll have kind of a medium-sized um, bill. As, as time goes on, so, um, you know, the lot of, like I said, a lot of them will arrive here in March. And by May, they'll actually molt their feathers. Um, so a lot of these birds will, will molt out of their gray and white plumage and they will molt in, into this rusty red color that you see down in the lower right hand corner. And this is what they look like. This is their, their breeding plumage. Um, and you know, by May or mid-May, when a lot of these birds take off from here, um, this is what that'll look like. So they, they have a pretty, pretty substantial transformation in this time. Um, and this is another reason why this is a staging area for them is because they have to replace these feathers. Um, and it takes a lot of energy to replace the feathers. Um, you know, think about, you know, a bird basically replacing every feather, almost every feather on its body um, during a, a period of two months time. So, you know, and they have to then put on enough weight to make a, a big long um, migration north. Oh, I forgot about the piping plover. Um, so this is the last bird. Um, so piping plover is another species of plover that, that we have here on Kiowa. Um, this guy is, is mainly here during the winter time. So, you know, they, um, they're here, you know, 
for they're they're here most months out of the year um, during migration and the winter, but they do not nest on Kiowa. Um, they're nesting, you know, they they're nesting in um, in three different populations. We have an Atlantic coastal nesting population, which extends from basically North Carolina up through um, oh, even into oh, out of in the Maine, Nova Scotia. Um, there's a a uh, Great Lakes population, which is endangered, which is very small, but is actually increasing, uh, where they nest along Lake Superior and thing and places here in, in Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, there's even some that are now nesting in, along Lake Michigan in Chicago area and in Ohio um, also. So um, they there are some new new birds that are beginning to find. Um, other other nesting places that, that historically weren't around the Great Lakes. Uh, and then there's the Great Plains birds that, that actually are that nest here in the Great Plains, kind of in along uh, river areas um, that might have, you know, sandy shoals and things like that. <laughs> uh, I mentioned that they're migrants, um, so they're in their winter residence here. Um, certain populations are federally or threatened, uh, depending on which one. Um, and on average, we have about three to eight individuals that, that will spend the winter on Kiowa. Um, some years we will have, you know, three to five that will winter on the east end of Kiowa. And some years we might have five to eight or less that may spend the winter on the west end. Um, and the birds that, that winter on the west end um, will also basically they, they split their time between um, Kiowa and Seabrook. Uh, during the peak of migration, which is coming up for piping plovers in about mid March, um, you know, we, we can find more than 100 of these birds um, that has been seen during a single survey on the entire beach of Kiowa. So um, it's, you know, it, it's if, if you hit the peak of migration right, you can see a lot of pipe and plovers on Kiowa um, during mid-March or so. Uh, and a lot of these birds are, are migrating north um, and they're, they're just using Kiowa for a short period of time, maybe a day only um, or two, and, and they're, they're moving on. Uh, so this is kind of what they look like. Um, so when you see most of them here on Kiowa during the winter time, they're just going to kind of look like a, a pale gray bird. Um, they'll have a white belly, a light gray back um, and head. Um, generally, their bill will be black, um, but that does change when as we get closer to, to, to springtime and their bill does change kind of color um, into orange. They'll also get this black band here. So you can kind of see a pale breast band here. Uh, but as these birds kind of molt into their breeding plumage, they tend to get a little bit more black on their breast. And then they'll get this little black spot on their forehead as well. Uh, they typically have yellow or large legs, which will get a little bit brighter also um, come springtime. Uh, kind of a unique uh, feeding feature that piping plovers do um, is you might see a bird that is basically shaking its foot in the top of the sand and uh, it almost looks like you know they, they've got something stuck on their foot and they're trying to shake it off but, but really what they're doing is they're they're moving that soft sand um, and mud and trying to shake that up a little bit to to see if they can disturb a prey item that might be kind of in the sand. Um, by doing that, they may see something move in the sand and then they'll, they'll kind of pick it out of the sand. Um, they eat worms and, and lots of other different invertebrates, uh, but that's a very common feeding uh, behavior that we'll see with piping plovers that, that a lot of other um, of the plovers we, we don't generally see. Okay, so this this slide kind of kind of goes over the the timing of of kind of when these birds are here. Um, it's kind of an overview of what I already talked about. But you kind of see it all at one time now. So uh, lease turns are are basically here from April through July, uh, and they're when they're here they are they are nesting. 
Uh, Wilson's Plovers are mainly here um, from March through July, although I did mention that we do have Wilson's Plovers that are here year round. Um, but when it comes to stewarding, um, we're stewarding for Wilson's Plovers and lease turns during the nesting season. Um, and also uh, the same for oyster catchers. Uh, piping plovers are mainly just here during the winter time and during migration. And red knots, the big focus for red knots is this March, April, May period when they're staging here on, in very large numbers. And uh, that's kind of when they need the, the most help is to try to help, help lower and reduce disturbance for them during that period. Um, so I kind of mentioned, uh, I'm not going to go over all a bunch of other species here, but you know, by, I did mention by, by helping, by focusing on those five species, uh, we're also in turn kind of helping all the other species that are used in the island as well. Um, you know, the different terns and different plover species uh, and some of the different shorebird species that are here too. Uh, and there's a lot of them. Here's kind of a list that I made of a lot of the common birds that you might see out on the beach. Um, uh, so I'm not going to go through all these at all, but um, you know there there are a lot of different species that that use the beach that um, that are benefiting from from our our stewarding um, on the beaches. All right. So next we'll talk a little bit about some of the protected areas. So I alluded to that we do protect parts of the beach during certain times of the year um, to help shorebirds. Um, and so we have, we do have what is called critical habitat. Um, and we've designated that on both ends of the island. So on the east end of the island, um, from the ocean course east is all designated critical habitat. Uh, and there's certain restrictions that, that are in place for that area. Um, and the same with the west end of the island, which um, if anybody has walked down towards the end of Captain Sam's spit, you'll notice a sign about halfway down that says no dogs beyond this point, critical habitat. Uh, that's about where the critical habitat begins. Um, and that is just a, a designated area that we have, that we've kind of carved out of the beach to, um, we, we do not allow dogs at any time of the year in this area. Um, so whether they're leashed or not, um, there are no dogs allowed in this part of the island at all. Uh, the, another thing we'll do during the nesting season is we'll actually determine an area where these birds are nesting and we will put up a bunch of signs um, that look like this sign right here, this yellow sign. And, you know, I think last year, I, don't, I forget how many I put up, but um, it might have been like 180 of these signs that designate the nesting area. So we basically put signs all around the area that these birds are nesting to, to alert people that birds are nesting there and try to keep them uh, from going in there. <clears throat> um, and then this, this is just a dog. Um, this is available online and, and in different areas, but this just shows kind of our our pet restraint map of where dogs can and can't be during certain times. So um, currently um, dogs in this green zone, dogs can be off leash um, this time of year, uh, but in a few days that changes. So on March 15th, that will change and dogs will have to be on leash um, anywhere on the front part of the beach, except for this blue area here, which is our dog use area. Um, and this is the only area on the island that dogs can be off the year, year round. Uh, and then, of course, the critical habitat areas here on the ends are um, designated no dogs allowed at any time. All right, so that is it for my portion. I'm going to turn it over to Betty, and she's going to talk a little bit more in depth about the actual shorebird stewardship program and and uh, what goes into to helping out with that. Um, Betty's been doing this for several years and uh, she's been a great asset of, of getting this program um, really involved and um, getting a lot of people excited to, to help out. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Betty. 
Thanks, Aaron. I'll, I'll let you know when it's time to switch the, the page. Hello, everybody. I thought I'd begin by just telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I've always loved birds, but I really didn't know much of anything about shorebirds. So uh, just like you, a number of years back, I attended a, a Kiowa Island shorebird stewardship meeting, like an informational meeting, and I found it all very interesting. Uh, but I must say, I will always remember my big aha moment. And that was when I heard the same statistics. Well, I don't think Aaron sh shared them today, but he has in the past. But anyway, I heard these statistics at that meeting. And that was that in 2016, in a study, we learned that shorebirds have seen a nearly 70% decline in the last 40 years. Let that sink in for a minute. A 70% decline in 40 years. And red knots at a much more rapid rate, they've declined near, nearly 85% in that same period of time. 85% decline in 40 years. And it, was, it, it just blew me away. And so in, in those facts alone really convinced me that I wanted to try to help to do something uh, to make a difference for them. Shorebirds are in trouble and they truly need human help. Um, some good news is that Audubon released a study a, a number of years ago that showed that beaches that have shorebird st stewardship programs have made a positive effect on shorebird populations. Several coastal bird species have grown their populations considerably faster than birds in areas without active stewardship programs. So stewards do make a difference. Next. Erin spoke to the reasons that shorebirds need our help. So I'll just cover quickly the details of our stewardship program. The focus of what we do is to just get out on the beach to educate and inspire beachgoers to appreciate and care about our shorebirds. We're not out there to police or to enforce, but to simply share with folks about the birds in a positive way and let people know how to help them and how to share the beach with them. Our season is from now through July, and we ask for a minimum commitment of just six hours from each steward. Of course, we're hoping that you enjoy it enough that you decide to do more hours, but uh, six hours is our minimum requirement. Next. So we are in the early part of our season. The red nuts keep arriving now. Um, we currently have hundreds of them in Kiowa. They don't have their famous rusty red colors yet. They're just a drab grayish color and they'll just keep continuing to arrive. And we expect to have thousands of them in April. And it's then that they molt into their beautiful red breeding plumage that we all know and love. And then when they are fat and rested and ready, they typically leave here in mid-May to fly to the Arctic. So during this period of time, while, we're, while they're here on the island, we need stewards to do two things, two different things. I wonder if, do you guys hear that voice? Yes, somebody yeah. needs to um, mute me. Make sure we're muted, please. They must be in the other room or something. Are you guys still able to understand me? Yes. We can still hear you, yeah. Okay, I'll keep going. All right, so during the time when the red knots are here, we need stewards doing two different things. When the tide is high, the red knots roost or rest on the ends of the island, mainly the west end. So we need stewards to be out there protecting the roosting flock by telling folks how important it is for them to be able to rest and conserve their energy in order to complete their migration to the Arctic. And then as the tide drops, the red knots break out and forage for food all along our beach. 
And when they're in the middle of their critically important task of feeding, they are often interrupted and forced to fly off due to walkers, runners, dogs, children chasing them, bicyclists, or simply people wanting an Instagram photo of a gorgeous flock of birds rising up in flight. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure on the birds to try to forage for food. So we need stewards with them talking to folks, telling people about how important it is to not disturb them and let them rest. So similar to what Turtle Patrol did, we've broken the island up into one mile zones, give or take, and we have stewards become zone walkers of their zone and watch for feeding red knot clocks that may need to be stewarded. We always time these shifts according to the tide, based on the tide of when the knots would be out feeding. Um, so we're just hoping that since many folks enjoy a regular beach walk anyway, that now you have an opportunity to combine shorebird stewarding into your leisure activity. You just take a walk and look for birds. Next. So this graphic shows the eight zones that we have for the zone walkers. We tried to keep it simple for folks. So with the exception of the ends of the island, we had each zone begin and end at a boardwalk. So um, they all might not be exactly one mile, but close to it. We just wanted it to begin and end at a boardwalk for it to be easier for people. Next. And then after the knots depart, we turn our focus toward the nesting area out on the east end, just past the ocean horse. Nesting starts in April and chicks arrive soon after. So we need our stewards to be either sitting by are walking along the critical nesting habitat, educating beachgoers to give the birds plenty of space to safely nest and raise their young out there. Uh, oh, Next. And for folks who want the option to be a year round steward, or for anyone who is here a lot in the winter, we continue shorebird stewarding all year long. Although piping plovers don't nest here, they are migrants who face many challenges, so they really need our help too. They feed and roost on the ends of the island, so that's where we need stewards for them. Next. Since you're gonna be out on the beach for at least a couple hours, it's helpful to be prepared. Make sure you wear your shorebird t-shirt, which will be provided to you. It, it identifies you as a key uh, Steward. Wow. Definitely have your cell phone in case you need to take pictures of what you're seeing or in case you need to call security if you happen upon a person doing something they shouldn't be doing. It's always a great idea to have binoculars. Trust me, you'll be glad you have them when you come upon a gorgeous flock of red knots and you want to see them up close. Um, we provide laminated materials, which include really nice close-up images of the various shorebirds. Um, and these help show beachgoers pictures of the beautiful birds that you're talking to them about. So you use them when you're out talking to people. And it's always a good idea to have a small notebook and pen handy to jot down and record things you see or any observations that you might want to report to me. Next. So I know what you're, many of you are thinking. You're likely thinking, well, I don't know much about shorebirds, so how will I know to talk, what to talk about with people? How will I even know what to talk about? I felt that way too when I sat in my first shorebird stewardship meeting, and I can assure you that you will not be left alone to figure it out. If you decide to join the stewardship program, you get a copy of this presentation emailed to you to review, also being recorded, so you can also watch it again for review when the recorded version is out. I email educational information and news of shorebird related events regularly, to stewards so that they can continue to learn over time. We host a number of bird walks where we can go out on the island as a group to look at shorebirds together and learn about them. And I will be lining up speakers to provide webinars on different shorebird topics. 
And then here, there's two really great websites to check out full of uh, lots of great shorebird information. Don't be overwhelmed by it. A good idea in the beginning is to mainly focus on learning just the few birds that we talked about here today. And you will just find that in time, you will gradually, naturally increase in knowledge and your ability to recognize the birds. The most important thing I wanna to emphasize today is that you don't have to be an expert on shorebirds and shorebird identification. I'm not, I'm still learning every day. And that's the fun of it. All you need is a heart for the birds and a desire to help them. And it just all grows from that. Next. So let's talk about when you're out on the beach. As I mentioned previously, we're there to educate. It has been my experience that beachgoers don't really need to hear a whole lot of information, just a little bit about the struggles of the bird or what people can do to help them or simply share with them some amazing fact or information about the bird's lives. Since the average person on the beach can't get close enough to truly see the bird's beauty without causing them to fly away, use the laminated materials to show up close images of them. Beachgoers seem to love that. Be enthusiastic about the birds. Enthusiasm is usually contagious, and if you can share anything to help someone connect to the bird, to make them feel compassion or respect for them and their struggle, then you've done your job. And I always like to end every conversation with beachgoers by inviting them to help by spreading the word about the birds to others. Next. Just a few don'ts. As I said before, and I can't emphasize it enough, you do not have to be a shorebird expert, but you will learn more and more about our birds as you go along. Also, again, we keep all interactions on our part friendly and positive. Even if you come upon someone doing something that angers or frustrates you, it has been my experience that most people just simply don't know about the struggles of the shorebirds and the help they need. They just don't know. Usually when people know better, they do better, usually. <laughs> And lastly, it's rare, it's never happened to me, but, it, but if someone were to get very angry with you, simply back off immediately and call island security if needed. But like I say, that's rare, never happened to me. If there's somebody that is doing something that they should not be doing and don't wanna to listen to you, uh, you can just simply report any violation from a distance. Just call Beach Patrol. I keep their number in my phone contacts, so it's an easy, an easy uh, way to get a hold of them quickly. Next. In review, just keep all these points in mind. But most importantly, the Shorebird Stewards experience should be fun. It's a fun opportunity to share how awesome our shorebirds are with fellow beachgoers. Next. And here I've already told you about bird walks, online speakers, laminated photo materials, and t-shirts that all shorebird stewards will be receiving. But also if you decide to join the group, I will be following up with an email for you to sign up for shifts. And here's the helpful suggestion. It's not, um, it's just an option. Uh, it really helps if you just choose a day of the week and commit to steward on that day or time. And that way you can sort of plan your life around it. So I encourage you just to consider that, but it's really, we're happy to uh, have whatever time you can give. Um, also of note, due to the busyness of the beach on weekends and holidays, these are times when stewarding is especially needed and spring break weeks, the weeks before and after Easter. These are all times when the birds can really use our help. Weekends, holidays, spring break. There's a lot of pressure on the birds due to the crowds on the beach during those times. So we really need our, our stewards to be willing to hopefully give some time during those times. So, for those of you who decide to join us, here's your homework now. Email me your name, phone, email address, and t-shirt size. 
and I need this information ASAP because um, I need to order t-shirts and prep other materials. So please get that info to me by Friday. I realize that there's probably many questions regarding the logistics of all this. So um, more details will be emailed to everyone who decides to become a steward. But also if you would like to discuss or ask anything, please feel free to uh, call me or email me first. And then if you would like to talk on the phone, I'm happy to do that. So email me first and then we can arrange a time uh, to talk on the phone and I can answer anything, any questions for you. Next. So that's it. I just wanna thank everybody so much for your interest in shorebirds and the stewardship program. We'd love to have you join us, but if you decide that it won't work into your life, then I'm just happy that at least you got to learn about our shorebirds and the challenges they face. And hopefully you'll spread the word to others. Tell your family and friends, teach, your kids and grandkids. The birds need everyone to know. Thanks for being here. Betty, right, that was good. really great. Can I, can I just mm -hmm. ask Betty a question? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. One of the things that I was really reluctant to go out on the beach and do this, and you really helped me figure out that it was a, it was a good thing to do and I shouldn't be afraid. But mm -hmm. tell us, um, this is one of the things I learned from you, uh, one of the many. But tell us what you do when you approach people, um, because you do it so well. Tell oh. us how you, what you usually say to them first. Well, thank you, Cindy. Um, well, I was t totally nervous when I was a new steward, too. I was very nervous. I didn't really know what to do. But I finally realized that... Um, I think it's a mindset that you sort of have to develop. And what I realize is we, as stewards, we know about the birds and we know about their struggles. And if you don't now, you will. <laughs> and so um, and so we have, I just look at it that we have awesome information to share with them. And so I have learned over time as the steward that when I'm walking along and I strike up a conversation with a fellow beachgoer and I point out a bird and tell them some little tidbit of info that most people don't know about that bird, they're always like, you're kidding me. I never knew that, you know, and they, they are... So our job is to sort of get them amazed or interested or share something heartwarming or something that makes them sort of care about the birds or to be interested or to, to really just appreciate. I always sort of leave and say, I always feel like it's uh, fun to be able to um, know about what you're seeing when you take your walk. And they're like, yes, thank you, you know, as they walk away. So it, to me, it's mostly, I look at it as a way, an opportunity to share awesome info about the awesome stuff we're seeing on our beach. All that, right. Does that answer that, Cindy? It does. And, and I think one of the things you said, you always said, and, and that I used, that I stole from you, <laughs> was the first thing I say are, how, you know, are you visiting? Where are you from? And then that kind of opens something up. And I'm, I've learned that it's okay, just like what you said, because I'm not a bird expert, just to have a few tidbits of information. Mm -hmm. um, and if anybody ever asks me, and they do, about things that I don't know, as a former educator, I just say, you know, that's a really good question. What do you think? Oh, we should look that up. Um, it's okay not to have all the answers. Um, so that's, that's just a, my little tidbit. Yes. All right. So I guess we, we probably have a few minutes to go through some of these questions in the chat. There's not that many of them. So um, I guess if you want to bear with me, we can kind of go through a few here. Um, the first one is, could a brochure about shorebirds and turtles be included with each bicycle rental uh, from the resort or other off-island rentals like island bikes? Um, if beachgoers and cyclists have knowledge, maybe they will act to protect. Um, that's, that's a really good idea. We've tried 
many, many times over the years for brochures to be handed out to different entities and uh, different things. And sometimes it works. Um, most of the time, it may last for a little while and then those brochures don't end up either they don't they don't follow through or they just kind of goes off um but it it possibly could be another idea um to look at in the future um you know one thing we probably don't want is to just give people a piece of the paper for them to take out on the beach because a lot of that paper will end up on the beach as well um you know we don't maybe not want to just pr to have a bunch of litter um that that may end up on the beach too <clears throat> Uh, next one is when do least turn chicks hatch? Uh, how many times will turns nest in a summer? So uh, this, so it, so for one, it, it depends. They they would generally only have one nest uh, in a summer, unless they happen to get, um, you know, their first nest gets overwashed or gets predated. Um, so they they will not have generally more than one clutch, um, just because it takes so long to raise their chicks. Um, so if, they, if they're successful, they'll just have the one, uh, one nest. Uh, but if something happens early in the season and they have time, they will re-nest uh, and try again. Um, and the chicks usually will hatch around, well, again, it depends sometimes on when they initiate nesting. Um, but let's just say, on average, most chicks are probably hatched sometime in May um, and potentially into June. <clears throat> uh, how many eggs in a least turn nest? Um, so this is generally three, um, but if, a, if an individual does attempt a second nesting after a first failure, that nest will generally have two eggs in it instead of three the second time around. Um, have the red knots always used Kiowa as a stopping point or is this just recently? Um, no, I think they, they've always used Kiowa uh, as far as I've been here. Um, and that's been 13 years now. Uh, red knots have been coming to Kiowa and, and doing this. And uh, even before I got here, uh, I know there were some researchers that, that were coming down here to uh, to see the red knots and, and stuff that, that use that use our area. Uh, so this is this is something that, that they've been doing for a long time. Uh, do the red knots return to South America? If so, where do they stop on the reverse trip? Uh, so they they do go back to South America um, and in the fall it's not as urgent to get there. So they take their time a little bit more. Um, so they, they don't have these huge staging areas as they're going south. Um, you know, in the, in the springtime, they have a very short window to breed in the Arctic. Um, it's, it gets, summertime in the Arctic is very short. So they have to get there, they have to do their thing, and then they have to get out before it get, they get snowed on, which can occur in July, the end of July um, or August up there. So um, in the fall, when they leave, there's, there's not an urgency to get to the wintering ground. So they probably are spread out a lot more and they probably take their time and just kind of work their way back down south. Um, what birds are we seeing on the beach now? Um, so that's a good question. There, there's a lot out there right now. So, so what we're seeing a lot of now, um, we're seeing a lot of migrants and we're also seeing a lot of birds that were here all winter. So birds that haven't left yet for the for to go north. So, you know, we're seeing there's a lot of willets on the beach, which is another species of shorebird. Um, there's a lot of dunlin. There's a lot of semi-palmated sandpiper or semi-palmated semi plovers out there. Uh, we do have red knots here right now. Um, we had about 300 or so that overwintered and. I just saw a report from a day or so ago um, where there was a, a thousand of them reported from, from Seabrook. Um, so, you know, that we might be, have already started to see, you know, our, our, some of our migrants um, arrive. 
Uh, there's lots of turns and gulls out there right now too. Um, we lace turns have not shown up yet, but as I know of, um, but we have some of our wintering turns like foresters turns and royal turns and Caspian turns um, and a lot of black skimmers as well. So, um, so there's, there's currently a lot of different species out there. Um, and there's a lot of birds to see. Um, that's all of the questions that were in the chat. Um, so unless anybody else has anything, um, I guess we can, we can end. Anybody else have anything? I'm just curious what happened in that early graph that you showed about the decline. There was a big spike just before 1985 of decline in shorebirds. Was there a big event that precipitated that? Um, let me look and see. <laughs> yeah, like I see what you're talking about. Um, Curious. Yeah, I, I mean, I without reading that specific study, I wouldn't know what may have happened there. I wonder if it was um, like oil spills or something like that that may have precipitated that big spike. Just thanks. Yeah, that I, I, I don't have any idea. Um, I mean, short bird numbers are fairly cyclical as it is, um, you know, depending on you know, some years are good years, some years are bad years, you know, uh, it's possible that, that that was a boom year, um, but then they they really fell off the next year after that. So um, it's, it's really hard to say kind of what happened there. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks. No, no, thank you. It was a great presentation. I appreciate all you do, really. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, I, I would like to say one more thing real, really quick. Um, and then I see one other person has a question. But um, I just wanted to say that I had not gotten any report that we have a thousand knots. So um, so that is very exciting, you guys. A thousand red knots. And even though it might have been reported from Seabrook, we share the same birds. Those red knots flit back and forth from Seabrook to Captain Sam's all the time. They use both islands. So we got a thousand knots now. That's so amazing. And so uh, I see lots of my stewards are on this call or on this uh, Zoom. So, okay, you stewards, get those t-shirts out and get out there and, uh, and start stewarding that flock. And if you aren't a steward and you wanna behold some awesomeness, go down to the West End um, at high tide and, and look for those, uh, grab your binoculars, you're gonna want them and go down and look at those, that flock of red knots and, um, and wait till the spectacle of their breeding plumage in April. So it's a treat and uh, stewards, get out there, start doing it. So, and now we got a question. Yes, um, am I muted? Nope. You're good. Okay. <laughs> um, this is uh, random, uh, <laughs> but I was wondering if uh, big events like, you know, the PGA, what effect that had, if we know, on um, the shorebird population? Because that was a lot of people. It was very, I mean, I don't want to diss golfers, but it was very disruptive to the environment down near the ocean course, near that critical habitat. Um, were, were there any um, uh, consequences that were noted in that? Um, yeah, so um, actually that the PGA actually helped the shorebirds this year, <laughs> that last, uh, last year because the we had deputies on the beach that prevented people from getting walking on the beach past the beach club and they were not letting people from the golf course out on the beach so we actually had hardly any people on the beach at that end of the island um, because they were keeping people they didn't want people to be sneaking on to the pga from the beach so we actually had that whole area blocked off so it, it, it may have seemed like, oh my gosh, there's so many people out there, 
um, but it actually benefited the birds last year. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Just one other comment that I'd like to infuse from being a uh, steward for a while. Um, for some reason, we've got people on Kiowa that think they're immune to the laws, like for taking their dogs into restrictive areas and things like that. So be aware of that um, because you might encounter some of those people and you simply have to tell them the town of Kiowa has a whole map there that gives the restrictions and you can follow that. And um, also fishermen who don't like to uh, follow the signs that Aaron puts up for the restrictive areas. So you have to be on the lookout for them as well. Report them if they go into the restricted zones. And that's it. It's fun. You guys get out and do it. Very good. Well, thank you. There was one more quick, quick question here popped in the chat about binoculars. Um, so, you know, there are binoculars that range from a couple hundred bucks to several thousand dollars. Um, and uh, I would recommend looking at the brand Vortex. Um, they have a range of different types of binoculars. Um, and what's good about this company is they have a really good um, warranty. And if anything happens to those binoculars, you send them back. It could even be your fault. Um, you send them back to them and they'll fix them for free or they'll replace them. <clears throat> So they stand by their products too, so. And, and I can't emphasize enough, um, everybody, whether you decide to steward or not, I, I think uh, anybody on Kiowa should always have a pair of binoculars with them because there is a world of awesomeness that opens up to you when you can look through binoculars at them. I mean, that's the problem with shorebirds is you can't get close enough to see how awesome they are because they fly away. And so you've got to have binoculars. And so we have the craziest, most beautiful birds on Kiowa. So invest in some binoculars. You don't have to get high-end ones, just get decent binoculars and uh, you'll be in for a treat. Yeah, and Karen just asked about the power. Um, so if you're looking at birds on the beach, um, 10X is probably a good, good power to have. Um, but if you want to use those binoculars for other birds, um, you know, let's say you want to look at birds in your backyard, 10x is, could, is, is going to magnify those little birds in the trees to the point where it might be hard for you to find them. Um, <clears throat> so I actually, the overall best power that I would recommend is, is 8x um, and 8 by 42s. Um, are kind of the all around best, you know, they, they'll bring those far birds in close enough, but then they also give you a wide enough field of view to kind of see those, the small birds and things too, that, that you might, uh, that you might want to kind of follow around. So um, eight by 42s is what I would recommend for the kind of all around. Um, but if you want to see things that are, you know, if you want to really bring in the birds on the beach that are far away, then, then 10, 10 by 42s are also okay. All right, well, I think that might be it. Well, thank you everybody for, for uh, tuning in. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing hopefully many of you on the beach this year. Anything else, Betty, before we go? Nope, just thank you everybody for your interest. Spread the word about the birds to everybody else that you see. They need our help. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was Bye well everybody. done. Thank, Thank you. you.